Greetings from Casa Goring, from Mickey, Aurora, and from me. Well, well, well. What do we have on offer today? Mm. Fortunately, things are not too eventful, so we can hopefully take a more considered view of things now that matters have settled down slightly, I would imagine, before they gear up for yet more drama and excitement. Eliza H says, today's Guardian UK is running fake news with the photo of Kamala and her nun grandmother burial, but calling the woman her grandmother. I saw it. Thanks for that. I saw it. The Guardian has run with the fact that Kamala's Jamaican family are all black. Well, why would we be surprised at that? The Guardian is the arch archetype of it's actually the arch newspaper in this country that promulgates the woke left-wing line. I'm actually disappointed that The Guardian, which used to be a very good newspaper, and whether you agreed with its slant or not, you could rely upon it to be accurate, has run with this fiction that Black Miss Burial is Kamala's grandmother, just because she was identified, and I hasten to add to those of you who are democratic supporters that the error could have been by the team which was doing the captions for the photograph. Maybe Kamala didn't do it herself. Let's give everybody an elegant way out of this. Nevertheless, it's not her grandmother. Dorothy Otty grew up beside her grandmother and said that her grandmother was fair-skinned. The woman identified in Kamala's book, I think something like The Truths We Know or some such thing, is definitely not fair-skinned. So, yes, I saw it. I also saw that they were trying to make out that the Harrises, I think they said uh, words to the effect that anybody who comes from Brownstown is virtually impoverished and that they are the lowest of the low in terms of socioeconomic funding. Then they published a photograph of her great uncle's house in Orange Hill, which is just a few miles from Brownstown. All of this is totally untrue, incidentally. To come from Brownstown doesn't make you the lowest of the low. It doesn't make you the most disadvantaged. It doesn't make you the poorest of the poor. It doesn't make you the humblest of the humble. And certainly not when you live in a million dollar house. They show a photograph of a million dollar house on the brow of a hill in Orange Hill. And we're supposed to believe that this is a family that is one step away from the poverty line. I mean, <laughs> why not just speak the truth? The Harrises are prosperous, established Jamaican family, whether they are the inside Harrises or the outside Harrises. 
they're not one step away from the gutter. And to make out that they are is, to my mind, extremely offensive. My sisters actually went to the Servite convent in Brownstown, which was one of the top schools in Jamaica at the time. And the idea that the Harris family, which owned land and owned slaves, would be, I mean, I'm just, I'm just stunned by the offensiveness of the Guardian and it's pushing a narrative which, why would they push this narrative? I mean, I have said all along that Kamala's father is a man of colour. So there I agree with them. But to make out that the family is something it's not, if they were as disadvantaged as they're being made out to be, he wouldn't have had the education he did. He wouldn't be a professor at Stanford University. I mean, the whole thing is so offensively classist and racist in the most unacceptable way, at least to me as a Jamaican. And yes, they had to go with a fiction that Beryl Finnegan is a black woman when she's not a black woman. I suppose if they th think it's going to help to get Kamala elected president of America, it's worth the, the fantasy. I see nothing wrong with her having come from an upper middle class background, which is what she did. She did not come from a middle class background. She came from an upper middle class background on both sides of her family, both her mother's and her father's side of the family. Her mother is Indian. It's really easy to check. India has a strict caste system. That is a strict class system. Her mother is not middle class, never was. Communist, yes, but middle class, no. Her father, upper middle class, maybe on the wrong side of the blanket. I don't think that his parents were married. That's my belief. I, I think that his father married Vioris Cambridge, but I don't think he married Beryl Finnegan. And I think that Donald Harris simply invented a marriage to make himself seem more respectable than he was. But all these lies, I mean, why can't people just speak the truth? I mean, are they, any, if anybody's voting for Kamala Harris, are they voting for her because of the degree of black she has in her ancestry? Or are they voting for her because she is capable? Because if they're voting for her because of her color, they're crazy. On the other hand, if they feel that she would make a good president, that's another matter altogether. Honestly, and the Guardian and the British establishment, labor establishment, and believe me, The Guardian is a rapidly labor newspaper, sending over a hundred activists. Our government's party sending over a hundred activists to the United States of America to influence the election. I mean, what planet are they on? I'd love to see what would happen if the Russians did it. Or the Chinese. 
or the North Koreans. Well, if it's unacceptable for them, I don't know why it's acceptable for us. I mean, such an intrusion into the United States of America's political system and its people, honestly. Anyway, enough said about that. J. Fra says, Hello, Lady C. I'm watching the developing media narrative on Prince William's coming We Can End Homelessness documentary. And once again, the media are creating an olive branch. <sighs> olive branch. The word olive branch, the expression, it's two words. The phrase is going to become, the description is going to become so, well, it's already so happening, it's beyond belief. It's infuriating and blatantly incorrect. In my opinion, this is the long-term damage the Sussex duo will do to the monarchy, continually undermining important work with trivial media speculations and gossip. The King's tour of Australia, Portugal home and divorce rumors, Prince William's homeless documentary, Olive Branch to Harry. Is there any hope that the continual attacking of the royal family will ever end. No, there isn't. As long as there's money to be made and as long as the media are going to be able to capitalize upon it and create a drama when there is none or a crisis when there is a drama or a disaster when there is a crisis. Oh, well, they'll create a pandemic if two people have a cold. <sighs> They're making money. And to an extent, I think some of it is acceptable. And I'll tell you why. It provides a counterbalance. It provides spice. Fabulous steak needs a little seasoning. <laughs> so I don't mind some of the nonsense that they come up with. But having said that, this nonsense about an olive branch, William made the point as a result of a clip with Harry in it, that his mother used to take him and his brother to homeless shelters if he had been ill-advised enough to just not mention Harry, they would have alighted upon that too. So it's, do you die, don't you still die? And then, of course, their favorite expression, the olive branch. I gavalt. But did it eclipse William's homeless documentary? No. Did any of the nonsense about Harry and Meghan are getting divorced yesterday, today, or tomorrow. Harry and Meghan are moving to Portugal yesterday, today, or tomorrow. Harry and Meghan are happily married yesterday, today, or tomorrow. Harry and Meghan are unhappily married yesterday, today, or tomorrow. Oh. Meghan appeared like a filthy scrubber. Sorry, Meghan appeared like Julia Roberts in that hooker movie. What was it called again? I've forgotten. Um, in the red dress. Uh, and thought she was going to out Julia, Julia, and she didn't. She simply looked like a whole group of dead rats had got caught up in her net in her head. And that instead of having the regular sort of Turkish virgin tendrils that she normally has. She had dead rats instead. Very inelegant. But 
I think we need to separate the wheat from the chaff. And a certain amount of controversy, a certain amount of sensationalism, a certain amount of dramatics is always desirable in terms of hooking people's interest. There is little doubt if you look at the reportage that has been done on the royal family in the last few years, that interest in them generally has increased as a res and their conduct has been noted as exemplary, desirable, for the good of the nation, and admirable compared to Harry and Meghan's. So, at the very moment that Harry and Meghan have been creating difficulties, and some of which have been profoundly difficult, their very existence provides a good foil. So, that's my take on it. Linda Cadman says, Dear Lady C, there has been an avalanche of nonsense support for Harry, the cheeky one media, followed by his notable absence. Like yourself, I am attached to my money. <laughs> Aren't we just good? So, with the following comments, I am only suggesting observations. Many US celebrities have disappeared since Diddy's arrest. Strangely, all around the same time that Harry has disappeared. Would you care to comment? With much love to you and your fur babies and appreciation for your insights, particularly on geopolitical issues. Thank you. Well, Harry sort of didn't disappear. Harry went to Africa. Harry went on a pseudo-royal trip. So Harry didn't rarely disappear. <clears throat> He's subsequently gone quiet. But yes, there is, I am told, a degree of behind the scenes moves for Harry's, well, for the media, I'm being very careful how I put this, for the media to take a softly, softly approach with Harry, or a more softly, softly approach with Harry, than they were taking in the event that the marriage collapses and there is the possibility, according to certain quarters, that the marriage is on the verge of collapse. There is, as I said in my book, Meghan and Harry, The Real Story, both the original version and the persecutors or victims version, that there has always been the fear in his family that if the marriage came to an end, that he could do something decisive and permanent. So there is that to consider. Also, he was far more attached to Meghan than Meghan was attached to him. Meghan is a succubus who attaches herself and then sucks the blood. All the while that she's sucking the blood, she's saying, I'm draining you of your poisons. Which Trevor and Harry and Corey Vitiello all fell for initially. Trevor Engelson 
according to that information, was left devastated at the end of his marriage with Meghan. He wasn't only left devastated, it took him a long time to actually process what had happened and recover from it. Cory Vitiello, no, because she had antagonized him. Harry, she has certainly shown Harry that her promises were often false and that she didn't know what she was talking about when she promised him the sky and delivered hot air and she was going to turn them into global superstars who would exceed the importance and the prestige and the fame and the everything else of William and Catherine. It hasn't happened. Harry is disillusioned, I am informed, at least up to a point. So, I mean, the mere fact that everybody has waded in, including Tina Brown, doesn't tell me that the palace set this ball a rolling. They didn't. Meghan and Harry set the ball a rolling inadvertently. And the palace have, has evidently stepped in and has spoken to people who are inclined to give Harry a break, making it easier for him to exit. That's what's going on, if you really want to know. And does it have anything to do with Diddy's arrest? Well, I mean, I would be very careful of treading upon that territory. But evidently, Harry and Meghan have both been to Diddy's parties. But then, so have many other people. Are they worried? Well, I don't think that what is going on with Harry and Meghan really has that much to do with P. Diddy and his parties. I would be very surprised if Harry and Meghan had lowered their guard enough to be caught in compromising positions. Save possibly with party favours of a mood elevating kind. That they might have been injudicious enough to indulge in. But the more on towards stuff, I'd be very surprised, very. And as you know, I'm no great fan of either Harry or Meghan, so. Angel says, Angel H says, I'm mortified by your backtracking on Harry. Slap me! After six years of constantly reminding us of Harry's appalling behavior, especially the way he treated his grandmother and Prince Philip, now you are telling us William will accept Harry back in a cordial way. Princess Catherine will accept Harry back to be polite. No, stop. I must take your orders, Manfura. You told us Harry will never be welcome back. Why are you saying this? Is this part of Operation Prepare the Public for Harry's Return? I don't believe the public will ever accept Harry back. This will be the downfall of the monarchy. Only weeks ago you were saying 
Harry should give up his titles and be removed from the line of succession. It's sickening hearing you try to sugarcoat the situation. Naughty me. And comes across like all the senior royals are now prepared to accept Harry back. And please stop telling us the king loves his son. It's clear to us what's happening. You're trying to prepare us to welcome Harry back. Forget it. Well, I, I've certainly been told, haven't I? But am I offended? No. I understand your passion. I understand your emotion. And I also understand that you have completely missed the point of what I was saying. I have never said that William would accept Harry back willingly in a cordial way, or that Catherine will accept Harry back to be polite. I said that if it becomes necessary for them to make a degree of a show, William would do X and Catherine would do Y, and I made it absolutely clear what their basic attitude would be. So sorry, I'm not backtracking. I'm simply presenting the facts in as nuanced a way with considering the likelihoods and possibilities as the situation unfolds. And I'm preparing you for the fact that if there were to be a show of any sort of unity, it would be just a show. So I think if you actually had cared to listen carefully to what I said, instead of letting your passions get away with you, you would have understood that I was actually not laying the ground to have Harry back, but that if Harry manages to inveigle his way back in and worm his way back in, in any degree, not to believe the lie, because anything verging on anything but the most reluctant of facades would be ill-advised to fall for. So, now, obviously, your response has been very visceral and emotional, and it's plainly motivated by your deep feelings of the subject, on the subject. And I'd be the last person to disparage anyone's heartfelt reaction. But you're allowed to have an emotional reaction. But next time, try not to be embarrassed on my behalf. There's no need to be ashamed or embarrassed on my behalf. And certainly no need for you to be embarrassed and ashamed because of something I've said. Uh, but my response has to be nuanced and accurate. And you know, a ball usually has north, south, east and west directions. So... I'm afraid simply going with a flat earth society when the earth is round would be actually cheating you and everyone else of the rounded explanation that you deserve. So I hope I make my position clear and my motivation clear. Okay, so you, the fact that I am careful enough to be nuanced and to be precise 
in the terms I use. It would be helpful to actually listen carefully to what I say instead of think, putting words in my mouth that I actually didn't see and coming up with meanings the opposite of what I intended. But I get it. Years ago, in 1993, I was at a debate in Scotland. I think it was in Edinburgh, if I remember correctly. I think Kirsty Walk is the one, I think, who, who was the invigilator, <laughs> so to speak. And every time I opened up my mouth, a group of women would attack me. And finally, Kirsty Walk had to say, actually, she's saying the absolute opposite of what you're accusing her of saying, and she's agreeing with you. And afterwards, they came up to me and said, oh, we didn't realize. Sometimes people let their passions interfere with their hearing. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. And, but thank you very much for your input and I'm delighted that you care. I would never, never discourage people from caring. Jill Jones says, from what I can gather, Megan moves from one man to the next as the opportunities arise. I think that she will not part from Harry until she has another target who can supply her with all she desires. That would be her base modus operandi, and that would certainly be of her previous conduct, a natural conclusion to come to. But remember, before Megan's relationships were more equal than her relationship with Harry has been. Megan has been the beneficiary of everything in worldly terms. Harry has been the beneficiary of nothing in worldly terms, except having managed to bunk up with a reasonably attractive woman who scrubs up reasonably well, especially considering the scrubber that she has proven to be. In a relationship of such gross inequality, especially when she promised him the absolute opposite of what she has delivered, because she has been the architect of it all, she may not have a choice anymore. Consider that. She may not have a choice. If he wants out and she wants to remain in and he can walk, he's the one who has the king of the United Kingdom on his side to a, de to a degree. Britain is the chief ally of the United States of America, irrespective of which political party is voted into power during the first week of November. The United Kingdom will still remain the United States primary ally. Don't delude yourself in thinking that Harry's relationship to his father, I didn't say relationship with his father. There's a huge difference between his relationship to his father as the son of the king and his relationship with his father as the aggressor and the persecutor of an innocent couple Two innocent couples, actually. If Harry wants out, 
and Meghan wants him to remain in. He has greater strengths to call upon than she does. Whether he has, and also I should say, Harry is a weak character, but Harry is very headstrong. Harry has been very easily led, but Harry allowed himself to be led. Harry is the one who surrendered control to Meghan. If he takes back control and he decides, I want out of this marriage because this woman is becoming something of, a, of an albatross, he and Harry is sufficiently ruthless that he will drop that axe. That's right. All the fears of the royal family were predicated upon the fact that Meghan is the one who would reject Harry. But if Harry is the one who rejects Meghan, He's in the driving seat. He is the stronger partner with the stronger control thereafter. And she can come up with anything she wants. It doesn't matter. She's not going to be able to prevail. There is a case, very well-known case, that parallels what I am saying. The Maurizio Gucci and Patrizia Reggiani case. To those of you who don't know about it, I would refer you to a fine movie that was made called The House of Gucci. It's really pretty good. Patrizia Reggiani was a hustler, an attractive hustler a determined hustler and a far brighter hustler than Meghan, but a huge troublemaker. And she took on the Gucci family and maneuvered the situation in such a way that Maurizio Gucci ended up in control of Gucci. She, but she then antagonized so many members of the family that they brought him down and with that brought her down and at that point the scale fell off, fell off his eyes and he'd had enough of her and he wanted a divorce and he she begged and pleaded and did everything in her power oh, I still love you blah 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 meant nothing to him he moved on and what did she do? She hired hitmen. <laughs> now, I'm not saying Meghan would hire hitmen, but the point I'm making is that when weak-willed, pee-whipped, meow-enchanted Maurizio woke up and saw his beloved Patrizia for the manipulative monster that she was. He didn't want to know. And he left. Well, she found a way of neutralizing him, but I don't think that's going to happen with Harry and Meghan. So, I think we need to bear all of that in mind, that she might be the one who is discarded, first time ever, but maybe Harry will have turned out to be weak, but not as weak as she calculated upon his being. So let's put it like that. Valerie Connor says, 
Megan has perfected portraying her love for people in photos. We've seen it with her former friends as well as her former partners, present ones as well. She throws her arms around their neck, bringing her face close to theirs and stares at them adoringly, also giving them an affectionate kiss on the cheek. It's usually the kiss of death for their relationship though, because the only people she hasn't discarded yet are Harry and Marcus Anderson. I guess she'll keep Marcus around as long as he keeps his position at Soho House. Harry is useful because his royalty keeps them in the news, but if he doesn't also keep her rolling in money and jewels, it will be bye-bye soon enough. Valerie Connor, that's one interpretation. There are others. There are others that he has woken up to the fact that she has led him who followed blindly with promises of how capable she was into revilement and he doesn't like it. We will have to wait and see what happens. I have said it time and again, and I'm going to repeat it. Their relationships like theirs are so volatile, they're so mixed. It's so one part positive, one part negative. And they have been so assiduous at providing a misinformation on a daily basis about their activities, aims, ambitions, inclinations, etc. That I am not prepared to believe one thing until I see it materialize. I know what I hear and I also know I'm not dumb enough to believe anything because one day it's the sun rises in the east and the next it rises in the west. I'm not dumb enough to think that that is a reality that is interchangeable. And since it's one thing one day and another thing the next, I choose to believe nothing until it, I actually see it materializing. That's the lesson I learned incidentally from my ex-husband, because in the morning he he would like something in the afternoon, he disliked it in the evening, he loathed it. And just before going to bed, he had never said an opinion on it whatsoever. And when you have people who are so wildly inconsistent and they are like an egg beater in your brain, just turn off, don't even listen to them. And by the end of my marriage, whatever he was saying, I just couldn't even absorb it. I wouldn't hear it. My, my defense mechanism was to repel the verbiage. Elena De Freitas says, Hi Lady C, Megan hit the jackpot when she got Harry in her clutches. That is the jackpot for recognition and status. But like many jackpot winners, she became too giddy and arrogant with success and has squandered just about all the benefits and taken Harry down with her. How will the children feel when they realize what has been happening? It depends how much poison Iago drips in Othello's air. And she is Iago and those children will be Othello. Children are often very influenced by their parents when they are young. If they have any intelligence and any sense of discernment and any perceptiveness, they will eventually see, if not all the light, at least some of the light. Depending on how painful their experience is at the hands of the offending parent.
Now, my therapist used to say that I was very lucky because unlike my brother and sisters, my experience had been so dreadful that my eyes were fully open while theirs had been dreadful enough for them to have some insight, but not as much as I did. I think that's worth bearing in mind. So it's very difficult to speculate what the children's attitudes will be down the line. But I would imagine at some point, unless they are hopelessly mixed up, they are going to look and think, how could you have thrown away all of my birthright the way you did? Margareta Halisey says, Lady C, why don't we see more of Prince Edward and his children? I think all no, sorry, we all think his son is just a doll. I think his name is James Seven. Yes, it is James Seven. He's, well, it was. He's now James Wessex. He was James Viscount Seven. He's now James Earl of Wessex. Because when his father became Duke of Edinburgh, he took over the senior title and became Earl of Wessex. Those children, by agreement with the late Queen, were not styled with their true rank, which is Prince and Princess, first of Wessex and now of Edinburgh. They were styled aristocratically as the son and daughter of an earl and now of a duke, non-royal. We don't see much of him because if he's not going to play a part in public life, his privacy is to a large extent respected. So I hope that answers the question. And on that note, I'll say thank you very much for listening. I hope this has been of some interest to you. If it has, please keep the questions and comments coming in so I will know what you would like us to be speaking about. Okay, thank you so much. Take good care and Godspeed. And if you have truly enjoyed this, would you care to like, share, subscribe, press the notification bell, and... Abiento.